Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Musical Inner Tube. I'm Don Rooney. And I'm John Tim Payne. You know, Don's had quite a career in radio and television, where he's been an air personality, a news anchor, even a TV weatherman. And John has been a college professor. He's written several books, and he's been an editor and features writer at the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper. We first teamed up for a radio show in college. On one show, we introduced a soothing musical interlude. But we stumbled, and it came out musical inner two. And that became the name for this podcast, where we talk with interesting people about their interesting lives, difference makers who really make a difference. Well, ladies and gentlemen, here at the Musical Inner Tube, we are just in orbit to have back with us Mr. Matt Kaplan. He's a staff member at the Planetary Society in Pasadena and host of its weekly radio show, Planetary Radio. And today, I don't know, not much is going on in outer space, but maybe we can get Matt to talk to us a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope. Unbelievable times here for the human race. Welcome back to the Musical Inner Tube, Matt Kaplan. Thank you so much, John and Don. Uh, it is it is a great pleasure. It has been a great pleasure to talk to you guys for, oh, half a century or so now. Pleasure's all yours, Matt. <laughs> so I hear you've been busy. Yeah, yeah, I've been busy uh, doing the show, and uh, there are changes going on with that. But uh, overall, things are going very, very well. Uh, I had a, a special uh, James Webb Space Telescope in the week that you you guys are talking with me and uh, uh, had to turn it out overnight because they had this big image reveal on a, on a Tuesday, and I had to get my show out by Wednesday morning. And uh, I managed to do it, and, and I'm happy with the result because, my gosh, it was well-deserved, uh, the attention that I gave it, and that the world is giving this amazing new uh, instrument of science. Well, let me tell everybody who's listening to this, both of you, that it's a tremendous episode. I listened to it, and I learned so much. Even though I've been uh, l- watching and listening things about the Webb Space Telescope for the past five days, I think this is one of the best that I've heard. So go oh. over to uh, Planetary uh, Society, find Planetary Radio, and listen to Matt's uh, brand new episode, uh, Made Overnight, like we used to write our term papers. Uh, <laughs> it's really wonderful. It really gives us a great tour. Let me start by asking you this, Matt. Um, you quote Bill Nye, who's the CEO of the Planetary Society, if I don't miss my guess, yep. uh, who says, it's a special feeling knowing that your understanding of the cosmos is about to change. And I'm wondering, how does a telescope change everything we think about the universe? Oh, well, go back to the first time anybody turned a telescope on the sky. I mean, you know, that was that Italian guy. What was his name? Galileo something. Galilee. Um, uh, he changed everything. I mean, he pointed it at the sky. He saw moons going around Jupiter. He saw Jupiter as a disk. And he realized that this crazy guy, Copernicus, uh, was actually onto something. <laughs> that you know, Maybe the, the whole universe doesn't revolve around us. And, and telescopes have been doing that ever since. And, and the JWST uh, maybe won't be quite the earth-shaking, culture-rocking uh, discovery that Galileo made. But then again, maybe it will be mm-hmm. uh, as it looks back to the edge of the cosmos. Uh, you know, great scientific instruments and, and the scientists behind them, they, they do rock our worlds now and then. And, and the JWST has already gotten a good start. Uh, back in, in, I guess it was 1995, I think it was, uh, somebody had some time on the Hubble and didn't have anything else to do, I guess. And they said, <laughs> let's point it at this little patch that looks dark and looks like there's nothing there. And the, the, the picture they came up with was full of galaxies, which was redone uh, by the JWST, uh, their first deep, deep field image. Again, cluttered with galaxies. Um, so many that they look like stars. Uh, what does that mean for the universe? That means that we're a lot more crowded than we thought we were. <laughs> well, we suspected they were out there. We just couldn't see them until this telescope. What, what's a great thing to do if you can find a place to do this is compare the deep field image from the Hubble, the one that you were talking about from, you know, like almost 30 years ago now, uh, to this one. And the, the difference is so striking. Uh, this one, you, uh, among other things, using gravitational lensing 
which uh, I, you, John, you heard me say in the show, Albert Einstein would be so proud. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, we're, we're looking at galaxies here that are within, oh, what is it? About mm, half a billion years of the beginning of the universe since hmm. the Big Bang, which is much farther back than we've been able to examine these before. Uh, and and we're also getting spectra from them. We're splitting the light into its components, and it's telling us what these galaxies were made of. Mm. Uh, so, you know, so as we look back 13 billion years, and there's so much we don't know about that period in the history of the universe. Um, that's why, other than it's just being so incredibly beautiful, this deep field is so important. I, and I will tell you a story. I was oh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I was in the office of a conservative Republican senator uh, on Capitol Hill. I was there with the boss, Bill Nye. And what do you see on the wall there? The deep field. You saw the Hubble deep field. Mm. And so, I mean, there's an example of how uh, these kinds of images and this kind of exploration, you know, touches everybody. Now, it happens that this senator was into this stuff. He's a big supporter, was a big supporter. He's no longer in office of, of uh, space exploration and space science. But, but still, I think it says a lot that a senator uh, chose to put it up on his wall. Matt, tell us again why the JWST looking out into space is not only looking out into space, but also looking back in time. Why, why is that? Ah, it's such a, it's a great question. And uh, it does turn telescopes into time machines. Um, light is really, really, really fast. <laughs> it's <laughs> In fact, according to Albert, it's the fastest thing there is. Nothing can even go as fast as light. Uh, and yet the universe is so incredibly vast. I wish I could remember how Douglas Adams put it in uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's so just mind-bogglingly huge that even light going 186,000 miles per second uh, takes a good deal of time. Now, you know, for example, it takes, I think it's about eight minutes, eight and a half minutes when the light that comes from the sun to earth, well, when it leaves the sun, it takes it about eight minutes to get here. So that's eight light minutes. The light coming from these galaxies that are 13 billion light years away that light took 13 billion years to get here. Get it? Light year? Light year is not a measure of time. It's a measure of distance because it's the amount of distance that light, a beam of light can cover in one year. By comparison, the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is about four and a half light years away. So four and a half compared to our nearest neighbor, compared to well, so far anyway, 13 billion light years. So the light we see, I mean, you know, some of those galaxies that we see, maybe all of them that are that far out, they're not even there anymore. They, they lived out their life. Their stars were all dead. They were absorbed by other galaxies. Um, we're, we are absolutely looking into the distant past. Uh, a, apropos of that, I understand that there was huge, amazing sort of uh, you know, when you look at the photograph, uh, and you, you could see it's sprinkled in the background with these little red dots. Why was that exciting? Why were the little red dots exciting? I, I think because pretty much all of those dots are also galaxies. That They just may not be galaxies that were sort of amplified or magnified by this thing called gravitational lensing. Uh, but uh, it just means that, you know, we're seeing... Well, as Don said, it's the universe is a very crowded place, at least on the galactic scale, uh, and it just it talks about the potential of this this telescope, which is only getting started. I mean, here's another thing to keep in mind: the deep field. If I remember the, correctly, the deep field that you were talking about, Don, that the Hubble got, it took ten days. It was a ten day long exposure for the Hubble to get that picture. Uh, with the detail that it was capable of. And so just think of leaving, you know, your camera shutter open for 10 days and trying to hold the camera steady. These pictures, all of these, all five of these photos released from the JWST, they were all photographed in the space of one week. The deep field took 10, I think it was 10 hours, 
Oh, I hope I have that right. 10 hours compared to 10 days. It may have been even less than 10 hours. And so, you know, imagine what this telescope's going to be able to do when it stares at something for a, a couple of days, uh, stares at one spot in the sky. Um, it might just be able to resolve more of those tiny dots way off in the background. And uh, uh, it's just, you know, <laughs> another thing Bill Nye likes to say is, uh, why do we build these things? Why do we go on these missions? Why do we build these telescopes? Uh, we don't know <laughs> because they're going to discover things. We don't even know the question. You know, to quote, to quote a former secretary of defense, uh, there, there are the unknown unknowns and that's what this represents. Unbelievable. Uh, yeah, there was a PBS uh, special uh, this week on uh, the Webb telescope in which uh, one of the executives at NASA says, when you look at these pictures, we think we talk a lot of, as though we know a lot. We don't know anything. <laughs> <laughs> there is a there is an article in the current Scientific American, a magazine that I love that I know one of you has a, a, a close and personal connection with. Uh, it's about the the current huge argument between astronomers, uh, which are like fighting words. They have two different uh, numbers for this thing called the Hubble constant, which has to do with how fast the universe is expanding. And it's like, if you look at the universe one way, you get one number. If you look at it a different way, you get a different number. They can't both be right at, at, unless there's something going on that we don't understand. Chances are there's something we don't understand. And maybe the web will help with that too. You know, one of the pictures that excited me probably as much or even more than the the deep field is the picture of um, the exoplanet. What is it? The oh. uh, uh, the wasp wasp ninety six B right ninety six B. Now, it, the only picture that I've actually seen is it's very fuzzy, and imposed over it is the 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 trail that they've seen where they were managed to find water vapor yeah. in the in the atmosphere. But still, a fuzzy picture of a planet that exists in another solar system somewhere else <laughs> is just God. incredible to me. I mean that that to me is more exciting than anything else. That there's a even if it's not inhabited by anything, there's another planet in another solar system, and we have proof, right? Don, I I am going to ruin your day. I I'm sorry. I I do oh. apologize in advance. That's not a real image of this planet. That's an artist <laughs> concept. Yeah, they are hoping. See, the, the, the web is not really designed to directly show us pictures of exoplanets, worlds going around other stars. There's another tool that we hope is going to be launched in four or five years, uh, the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is actually will be able to do that, you know, fingers crossed. What you're looking at there. Uh, because the web can't see an individual exoplanet, the star near it is just too bright. Uh, they they made up what maybe it looks like. Uh, what, but the real significance here is that squiggly line that shows the presence of water on this planet and that they were able to infer from that that this giant planet that goes around its star every 3.4 days, <laughs> wow, um, it has clouds. It probably has big cloud systems, water water ice or water clouds. Um, that's it. That's the spectra that they were able to pick up. And they did that because it passes in front of its star. And when it does that, the spectra, the splitting of the, the, the light, the electromagnetic radiation that we see as light, mm. it, it changes a little bit when the, when the planet goes in front of the star. And then when the planet goes around the back of the star, it goes back to being just the star, obviously. So when it goes in front of the star, they can look at how that spectrum changes and they can infer what the planet is what the spectrum is from the planet. And that's what you're looking at here. Yeah. So, sorry to say, I, I don't want to burst your, your planetary bubble, but, but uh, yeah, it's going to be a few more years probably before there, there have been a few direct images of some gigantic exoplanets that are not far away, uh, but they're not really very impressive. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, don't hold your breath for that, but it's coming. Oh, okay. All right. Well, I don't, I don't give a darn about the rest of these anyway. But. <laughs> I, I'm well, disappointed now. Yeah, no, no, I don't blame you. Well, the the other impressive picture to me, shifting gears real quick, uh, was the that uh, Carina Nebula. Oh, that man. actually is a very that looks like an, an an artistic piece of work. It looks like somebody painted that on. Uh, but that's an actual that 
don't get me wrong. I mean, is it a painting or is that an actual picture? <laughs> no, no. I've, this I've is ask now. <laughs> this is this is the real McCoy or the real McCarran Arena, I guess. Yeah, uh, this is the real thing. And you know, this is someplace else that the Hubble also looked at. Uh, and if again, if you compare the two, and I hope that you got a high res version of this because this image, if you get the original resolution, you can just zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in, and it just stays incredibly sharp. Um, the big difference here, other than it being so sharp, is that uh, the Hubble, which could only extend a little bit into seeing the infrared. You know, the light that is just outside of our range of vision, right. uh, which we, we can perceive as heat sometimes. Um, the, the JWST was designed to work entirely in the infrared range. And the great thing about infrared and the reason they did this is because infrared lets you look through a lot of gas and dust that you can't do with visible light, the range of light that we see with our eyes. That's why if you zoom in on this, you see these baby stars hiding out inside that cloud, which the Hubble could not see. And they're just everywhere in this cloud. And, and of course, it's the cloud that, you know, this, this baby star has been formed from. Wow. Uh, and the other thing that was pointed out to me uh, in that show that you heard, John, uh, by uh, the uh, planetary scientist, Tom Green, who mm -hmm. is going to have a couple hundred hours on the web to study exoplanets, he said he loves this that sharp, that well-defined line at the top of the cloud. And mm -hmm. he said it's there because basically you have the, the light of these baby stars, the one you see above the cloud, that are just pushing against that cloud and pushing it back, you know, as if they were wow. blowing on it like a breeze. And, and that's formed that, that, that really sharp edge to the cloud, which is, you know, we probably not going to look as sharp if you're next to it, but, but from this distance, it looks pretty damn great. So uh, I want to uh, talk about the, uh, the photographics of it a little bit. You don't need to have the numbers, but you can, we could talk a little bit about the, how the image was formed. Um, some people, uh, we're snarking about these recent images that we've had of uh, black holes. Uh, to me, they were very exciting, but a lot of people were snarking, go, well, they're not really photographs, right? You know, and <laughs> right, you know, they were just going, oh, come on. Wha? You know, and especially when um, I should explain to our audience that one of the images that came up more recently was uh, the center of our galaxy, uh, an object known as Sagittarius A. And, yeah. and it's and most galaxies have a black hole at the center of them. Um, and it, it sort of is both, uh, you know, where a lot of stuff gets sucked into, but it's also they help keep the uh, whirling gas, dust, stars, planets, trillions and trillions of, you know, massive civilizations, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> They actually give form and structure to the galaxy. They are sort of a a, a, a strangely a, a ambivalent uh, uh, object. But these, what we're looking at in the Webb telescope, these are true photographs in the way that we think of them. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us, I mean, how do they get the resolution that they get? Is it because of like the gold on the surface of the mirrors uh, the, the way they're bounced. I'm just wondering if you if you have any insights to that because I've noticed that too that the resolution is astonishing. I mean the yeah. the depth, basically the depth of the photographs. Uh, you could just open them up and open them up, and it's almost like you know uh, what's what was the name of Han Solo's uh, uh, rocket when they go into uh, hyperdrive. The Millennium Falcon. The yeah. Millennium Falcon. Remember how all the stars stretch, you know? <laughs> sure. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's very much like that. But can you talk to us about how they get that resolution and, and you know, that it is a real, you know, shut up, everybody. It is a real photograph. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, this is definitely a real photograph. Now, think about it, though. This is a photograph made from data that was in the infrared. We can't see it with our eyes. So scientists take the actual image and they add color to it that represents the range of, of, of spectra that they're seeing in that picture. Um, and, and, you know, some of it you might be able to see with your eyes, but this telescope doesn't do that. It only works in the infrared. Um, and, you know, the reason it's so sharp, 
that's simply a function of the fact that it's such a huge mirror. Um, I mean, this is this mirror is much bigger than what was the biggest telescope on Earth for so many years, the Hale telescope. That was to you know the mirror was two hundred inches across. Mm. This thing is gigantic. Uh, the gold on the surface they used because it's such a good reflector of uh, of infrared light, and uh, underneath it is beryllium, which is crazy stuff as a sidelight because they had to be really careful with it because it's actually toxic as they were, you know, machining these things. They had to be very, very careful. But, you know, if you will allow me, I want to, I want to say something about those images of the black holes, uh, Sagittarius A, and then the other one, the first yes, one please. that the Event Horizon Telescope got. I, I've heard that same argument. Oh, it's not really a photo. It's just reconstructed from radio telescope data. Well, Okay. So, um, John, I, I know you were a big fan when it came out of the Sgt. Pepper album, right? Sgt. Yeah. Pepper's Sgt. Pepper's well, I have to break it to you, John. That's not the Beatles. <laughs> 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 yeah, they're standing in my living room, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> no, those were just little bumps on a piece of plastic. And they, they got translated back into sound that was something like what the Beatles made. But close enough that we all got thrilled, right? Yeah. So that's exactly what the EHT images are. They take all these numbers, which represent an actual thing in space, and they turn it back into an image. You know, it doesn't bother me that it wasn't just, you know, light falling on a piece of, you know, Kodak or Polaroid film yeah. or uh, nowadays a CCD. But uh, yeah, that doesn't bother me at all. It's interesting because people expect uh, some of these uh, telescopes to be like a what were those Insta cameras called when we were kids? Uh, you yeah, know, the Polaroids. Yeah, yeah. Polaroids. Yeah, yeah, and, and just uh, but but what it's doing? I mean, a camera after all. I mean, it takes a photograph from available light uh, or enhanced light, uh, but it still has to be reconstituted to become an image, doesn't it? You know, it goes through a chemical process. You know, so really, really yeah. Yeah, it, none of us have seen. Everything is mediated, and none of us have seen a direct image. You know, uh, even I hate to say it, even the images we see with our eyes have been mediated by the old noggin. You know, it all goes, <laughs> it all goes through the front office. You know, if <laughs> if your noggin works, which mine doesn't, but um, you've, so you've just blown my noggin. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, we've we've shifted from space to philosophy now, and <laughs> in one swell foop. Why uh, is there air? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back to our podcast in just a moment. But first, here's a soothing musical interlude. Matt Kaplan is a staff member at the Planetary Society in Pasadena and host of its weekly radio show, Planetary Radio. Matt has more than 30 years as an instructor at Cal State University at Long Beach. Matt is also a well-known public figure as a raconteur, blasé farceur, debonair blagueur, and pâté de foie gras. He is possibly the first plate of French food we have ever had on the musical inner tune. On top of all that deliciousness, Matt has been host and moderator at a range of public roundtables and conversations, especially those about science or space. Check out the Planetary Society website at planetary.com. Org. And check out Matt's website at planetary.org slash profiles slash Matt, M-A-T hyphen Kaplan, K-A-P-L-A-N. And now we return you to the musical inner tube. Uh, Matt, let's talk about how you, you were talking about the, the makeup of the JWST. This took years to put together and it was a very perilous flight to get it up and out uh, out of its shell and, and all get all the mirrors lined up and, and focused and everything like that. Plus it's a million miles out there. So if it screwed up, it was a million mile piece of junk floating out there. Yeah, that's right. Yep. Uh, it, it, and there were, I forget how many, 176 individual points of failure. 377. <laughs> Oh, thank you. I was off by more than half. Uh, it's yeah. I knew it was a lot, and everybody I ever talked to, and I, you know, I did. I think I did my first interview about this in two thousand six, 
And we kept thinking, okay, it's right around the corner. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It almost got canceled several times by Congress or NASA, and it did end up costing about $10 billion. And until it actually unfolded and started to work, there were people on the JWST team who I know well who I say, what are you most worried about? What do you think is going to be the thing that will fail that, that, you know, keeps you up at night? And they would tell me what that was, some particular piece that had to unfold on the telescope or whatever. And it just seemed like, oh, it's just too complicated. How can this possibly work? And it did. It does. It works perfectly. It's already working beyond uh, what they had predicted. Uh, And so it is just, first of all, it's it's an enormous, a mighty testament to the capabilities of the team behind it, the engineers, the scientists, the people with all the other skills that went into this. I mean, years and years and years ago, I watched as seamstresses sewed the 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 solar shield, the wow. five layer solar shield for this spacecraft. So you know, talk about interesting skills that were needed to complete this. Uh, it took it really took just about everybody with, with every kind of a skill you could imagine. Um, and but there were times when you know it just seemed like a boondoggle, and you know there there's no question that because money kept getting put into it, that money could have gone into you know a mission to Mars or Neptune or some other worthy scientific cause. Um, it it to me now it's proving to be a great investment, especially if it's around doing this kind of work for another. 20 years or so, which is what we all hope will happen. Um, you know, amortize that over 20 years and it, it seems like, <laughs> well, like a bargain. What, what you get too is, uh, you know, like the Voyager spacecraft and those kind where they were expected to be 20 or 25 years and it they lasted for 40 or, or more years, still sending data back. Coming up on 45. Next month yeah. is the 45th anniversary of the Voyager mission. Yep, you're absolutely right. It just tells you how well... NASA and its contractors and its centers, they, they really know how to put stuff together. You know, I think to me, I, I want to just meditate for a little moment on the uh, solar shield, which you mentioned. Uh, it, you're going to have to, ladies and gentlemen, listening to this, you're going to have to go online and see a cross section to see exactly what I'm talking about. But um, these, uh, and Matt just made a really good point that something like uh, Voyager, that was a series of, of people in a room, you know, some of the smartest people of all time, trying to, trying to figure out, okay, if space is like this, then we have to design this thing like that, right? Huh. So they were trying to anticipate what this, this uh, machine would um, encounter as it moved through the solar system. They not only were right, but they were right a lot more than they knew because – not only did it go through the solar system, but I think it's out of the uh, uh, heliosphere now, right? It's the first yes. uh, humanly made object, uh, not only to leave our solar system, but to leave um, basically the um, the area of influence of our sun. And now it's out in deep space, uh, the first time that anything human has ever gone there. So having made this point, think about this, folks. Um, first of all, they they picked a sweet spot. Tell me if I'm wrong, Matt, but they picked a sweet spot in the Earth's gravitational field, I believe, something like that, right out a million miles. I forget what it's called. And they nestle it there. Secondly, one side of it faces the sun and, and, and that uh, reflects the sun's light and absorbs it so that it doesn't cook <laughs> the telescope. Wow. Yeah. And, and, and as you were saying... There are five layers of extraordinarily thin mylar-like substance, and they had to be stretched. They had to be opened and stretched. If anything tore, it was all over, right? And the design has it so that these five layers are spaced out a little bit so that you get the most out of the insulation. It's like how you insulate your house, you know, using spaces. and. This means that the other side is within uh, 50 uh, degrees of absolute zero, that the mirror side is in almost absolute zero. It's, to me, just realizing that people anticipated what they'd need to create. And so far, I mean, I realize there could 
a space bus could come and run over the whole thing and goodbye. <laughs> but, you know, space is not a, you know, hospitable place. But right, it could, you know, it could do its job for a lot longer than the $10 billion would go. Yeah. Knocking on wood here. You described all that very, very well. So, uh, oh. gold star, John. Um, yeah. Uh, it's uh, First of all, the point that it's at is L2, which is Lagrange 2. Uh, because there were people who realized uh, that there were these spots in space where the gravity of two or more objects like the moon, the sun, the earth would be really well balanced. And it would take very, very little effort to keep something in that space. We've used it for other other spacecraft. Uh, The great Gerard K. O'Neill, who started the L5 Society, Uh, the goal there was to build a giant human colony in space and put it at another of these Lagrange points, the one called L5. Well, the web uh, is at L2, and it is pretty easy to keep it there because the gravity is so well balanced. And you're absolutely right. It's like 200 degrees uh, uh, Celsius above uh, absolute zero on one side and uh, uh, about 50 on the other side. And this was really important because uh, infrared, you're dealing with these tiny, tiny uh, uh, amounts of heat that have to be detected by this telescope, because after all, the light is coming from 13 billion or more light years away. And so it has to be kept extremely cool, because even just the ambient temperature of space, or certainly radiation from the sun, these signals would just get lost in that. Um, And there is one instrument on the uh, web, the the middle infrared instrument, MIRI, I think it is, uh, that has to be even cooler. So it's the only one that has an active cooling system, like a refrigerator. It uses liquid helium, and that gets down to within about seven degrees above absolute zero. So let's hope that that keeps working, because uh, that's, that's going to be a really important instrument. So what you're saying, Matt, is if uh, I had a party, uh, MIRI would be uh, ma- uh, you know Matthew McConaughey. That's how cool it is. He's so cool. <laughs> he is that. It is that cool. Yeah. It's almost McConaughey cool. Uh, and without the sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it seems to me that um, we, we've got the JWST out there looking and we are looking now to go back to the moon. We're looking to go back to Mars. There is an awful lot of interest in space right now. <laughs> Uh, this moment that we couldn't have found 10 or 12 years ago in the United States. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I gave a talk uh, two nights ago to the uh, uh, Astronomical Society of Long Island, a bunch of uh, amateur astronomers. And uh, I borrowed a phrase from my former colleague and still friend, Emily Lakdawalla, who calls this the golden age of of solar system exploration. But it's really the golden age of of exploration across the cosmos. I mean, here we have telescopes revealing black holes, actually showing them to us as as we've never seen them. We have spacecraft that have uh, visited at least once every planet in the solar system yep. uh, and and hopefully more to come. I mean, the, the recent decadal study from the National Academies called for an orbiter to go to uh, Uranus, which is, by the way, the right, the correct way to pronounce it. Uh, and Thank you. John, take note. Uranus, okay? <laughs> okay. I know where your, your minds are. So, um, I, and, and all the stuff that is about to start happening again at the moon you know, NASA likes to say the first woman and the next man. Well, it looks like we're getting there. Uh, and uh, my God, the flotilla of spacecraft above and on Mars, which is just mind boggling. The, the place is the place is crawling with, you know, Chinese uh-huh. uh, investigators, French, British, American. We're flying helicopters on Mars. It's such a gas. Oh, and let, let me tell you, the one that I am so excited about, even though it is still, God, it's going to be well into the 2030s, uh, the project called Dragonfly, which is a, it's the size of like a Mars rover, but it's an octocopter. It has eight helicopter-like propellers, and it's nuclear-powered like the Mars rovers. It's going to go to Saturn's moon Titan. 
It's going to land on Titan and poke around, drill down, take pictures, send them back to Earth. And then when it's finished with that site, it's going to take off, just like the Ingenuity helicopter on Mars, fly somewhere else on Titan, set down and tell us some more stuff that we've never known before. <sighs> that is going to be just so astounding because Titan in some ways is, you know, it's it may be more like Earth than Mars is. It has seas, it has rain, it has rivers, it has everything except, you know, liquid water because the stuff that's in those rivers and making those valleys and filling those seas is liquid methane and a little bit of liquid ethane because it's really, really cold out there. Uh, but and and then the the mountains you see are water ice because at that temperature water ice is as hard as rock. It's it's like a through the looking glass world. And you know we had a little bit of a taste of it from Cassini yeah. and the Huygens lander that worked only for a few minutes on the surface of Titan. That was a European Space Agency project. This thing is going to stay up there. Let's hope for years and uh, show us the most amazing stuff that we maybe have ever seen in the solar system. Are we at a point now where people have pretty much accepted the fact that men and women don't have to go to these planets, that we're getting everything that we need out of robots, out of the uh, the, the mechanical uh, uh, things that we send up to these planets? That is the, the $64 billion question. Uh, and, and those are fighting words for a lot of people in, you know, the business that I cover. Um, there are people who believe it's crazy to send people out there when robots are just getting more and more sophisticated. There are people who believe that, uh, no humans can still, and will for many years be able to do much more than robots can in a fraction of the time and that it's worth it. And it's also so inspirational, especially for young people to be able to see humans walking on the surface of the moon, let's say. I don't know how many scientists and astronauts and engineers that I know were first inspired by, you know, people like Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Um, so there's great value in that, in having humans do that. And then there are the people who say, nope, it's got to be a team. There are things that the robots will do better, and there are things that the humans will probably need to follow up with. There is no question space wants to kill us. Uh, yeah. Space is deadly in you know more ways than I can probably count. Uh, but we're learning how to deal with that. Uh, the radiation, the vacuum, <laughs> the loneliness. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it, 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 I, I, I am confident that there will be humans walking on Mars. I don't know if there'll be Americans. I kind of hope they will be because I'm kind of proud and parochial that way. Uh, but they may not be. They might be. They might very well be uh, Chinese taikonauts or, or who knows where they'll be from. Uh, but uh, I think it's going to happen and I think it's important. But we have a lot to learn before we can do this stuff. I mean, even the moon, if we're going to have a permanent installation on the moon, the moon wants to kill you too. The dust on the moon will try to kill you if you bring it back into your into your habitat because it's like little microscopic razor blades. Uh, and and on Mars, they're not razor blades. They're worn down. It's just toxic, the dust. So, um, yeah, we're not designed for this stuff, but maybe we'll redesign our, ourselves for these new environments. Well, Matt Kaplan, uh, just, what, uh, just a trip uh, through... <laughs> The cosmos and through the even larger cosmos in some ways of the human imagination. I mean, we're celebrating uh, and, and one of the reasons that everybody has that look on their face that that people had at the end of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, you know, when they're uh, when they're seeing the first aliens come off the ship. Uh, on that PBS special, you saw all the scientists and they had that look, you know, the wide yeah. open eyes, the the joy of, of seeing and learning something that you had never seen before. We're all doing it together. It's, uh, I think Don is right that we've really not uh, ever had a, a moment in human history quite like this one. I couldn't agree more. First of all, I love that, that scene in that movie, that climax yeah. of that film, but uh, yeah, we live in, in thrilling, exciting times. And uh, you know, to quote uh, Humphrey Bogart, uh, it uh, shows you that uh, the little problems of, of human beings don't amount to uh, more, much more than a hill of beans 
uh, down here on Earth. Of course, they can seem pretty serious when it's your life and your future at stake, but it is it is somehow uh, reassuring and and comforting to be able to look up across the universe and uh, see what's going on elsewhere and and enjoy it together. Thank you for coming on the musical uh, inner tube. Uh, we always love it when you join us, and especially uh, on this episode because I think one has a sense that something amazing has happened. Couldn't agree more. Love the musical inner tube. Always have. Love you guys. Thanks for inviting me back. Thank you, Matt. Space. The final frontier. I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I'm glad you raised your hand for that, John. Down the hall, uh, by the way. Thank yeah. you. And on the right, not the left. Remember what happened last time? <laughs> I walked it I walked into a great sandstone building. <laughs> oh my nose. <laughs> I wonder where Ruth is. <laughs> Doggedly. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Musical Inner Tube. Check out our website at musicalinnertube.com where you'll find all our episodes, profiles of our guests, and lots of extras. You'll even be able to leave us a voicemail. Our email address is musicalinnertube at gmail.com. And on Twitter, our handle is mintertube. Capitalize the M and the I. The Inner Tube is available on Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, Audible, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iHeartRadio Podcasts. Like us and give us a good review on any of those platforms. Music